He's PJ. Hello there. I'm the Dean, and we are the Books Boys. This is the, the Books one Bo- and only. This is the Books Boys show. Get it? Buy it? Books. Oh, I interrupted you there, Dean. The, but it was the, my fault. I, I forgot that you know, you'd think after 22 episodes, I'd remember which, which bit comes in, in which order, but apparently not. Well, the, it, it's, it's very shocking. Shocking ah. stuff. And you know what's even more shocking? What? So I made my way today to the library in Dresden. So I heard of this place. They call it a bibliothèque. And supposedly mm-hmm. it's a place where they keep books. So you've gotten out of the supermarket, you've gotten out of the toilet paper aisle, and you find somewhere, you've heard a rumor there might be some books in this uh, this building you're in. Yeah, so it's got a building and there are bathrooms. So I've been inside the bathrooms, checking out the, the toilet rolls. Sure. Um, but I, I, I can't find Shakespeare's complete works of um, of plays. I, I, might, I might have found some P.G. Woodhouse. But I'm not sure the scripture is a bit. Well, okay. maybe maybe they're sold out of Shakespeare. Did you find you know any any Plato or anything like that in there? Well, I, well, you see, I didn't find that much at all. I thought it was supposed to be full of these of these books, but I just found a few handful of toilet papers. That no publication dates. It didn't say if it's first edition or third. Mm. Um, it, you know, made made in China, so it seems to be very big into the uh, Chinese authors, postmodern right. okay. Chinese authors. I think it's a new movement, post postmodern Chinese literature that uses invisible ink and and scripture on, on scrolls. I think that's what the new book is. Yeah, and they, they love the scrolls in the in the bathroom section. Do you know I'm I'm excited because I put it 22 months ago when I made the intro to the show. I said live from the Grand Library, and this is the first time that either of us have actually been in the library during, during the show. Oh, so. <laughs> well, there you go. I'm literally in the big. I'm literally in a big library, so today instead of cricket, there are echoey big halls and some disgruntled-looking students giving me the look. Mm-hmm. So that's so, what today's atmosphere is. So the good news is we don't get sued for lying about where we host the show in a library. And, and secondly, um, you, you didn't bring the crickets with you, right? I, I'm afraid I left them in Italy. Um, I, okay. Good. I was hoping that Alex was going to send over a packet mm. from the US, but it hasn't, hasn't arrived yet. I'm a bit... The, the good news then is that this episode should be um, like child's play after the technical um, nightmare that was last month, um, which it came out okay in the edit, but it was a lot of work for us. <laughs> it was a lot of work and it was last minute. I think we only had a few hours until the end of June. Yeah, it, it was, was, uh, that yeah, was the, last the most difficult episode to do, but we, we got there. So... I should just mention quickly, because like schedule's all over the place at the minute. We're recording a few days early as well. Summer, summer gets in the way. You were in Italy, and you know, as you mentioned, our, our other co-hosts from Playboys, Alex and so on, are everyone's traveling around. I'm just back from, from a week and a half in, in Spain myself, so everything's a little bit uh, last minute. I even um I, I spent I spent uh, two days, two entire days just dancing on the beach to, to Spanish music. Uh, 14 and a half hours, you know, dancing to Spanish music on, on the beach. I oh, saw a whole lot of bands that yeah. probably no one listening will ever have heard of. Um, and then I went to this very fancy garden in Barcelona and I saw Cool and the Gang playing under a Juliet nice. balcony in a very lovely setup. And then I saw a French singer, Zaz, and I watched her car get mobbed by the fans, like paparazzi taking photos through the window of her, of her car, um, which I thought was a little bit disrespectful, you know, but... Um, so it sounds like you had some literary adventures, some Woodhousian adventures. I did, and of course, I, I told myself I'm not going to bring back any books, and then I brought back just four or five, not too many, you know, um, but just a few books that I, I got. Um, some the bookshops in Spain are fantastic, and you know the reread I really love because you get them very cheaply. The new the new books shops can be quite expensive in Spain, um, but I, I, I love it. I love to buy the books and bring them home because they have great selection they have more Dumas for example there than we have usually here nice nice Wilkie Collins and all that you know they have a really good selection they love their their classics so I've got a few but look I'm gonna I'm gonna start I'm gonna tell you about the first book I read this month I have it here I'll show it to you it's called a countdown to a killing and by Tom Von Macaulay now, this book has only just come out this month in July, so it's, it's brand new. So we're one of the first to get our hands on it. And the, the interesting thing about this book, PJ, 
is that the entire the entire story is told in in correspondence so it's all whatsapps and emails now it's about 300 pages but i i read it in one day because it was so so addictive and the conversation style made me want to keep on you know constantly um reading yeah so so as i'm saying the whole book it's all whatsapps and emails there's no narrative at all um, and what? i read all 300 pages in one day because it was so addictive really yeah it's it's a brilliant concept and it is a crime book and yeah. the author is actually a solicitor himself so he he works well i don't know exactly what area of the law he works in but He's, he's produced this amazing detective novel and it's called Countdown to a Killing because the idea is that there will be a murder later in the book and they tell us oh, that. Okay. And sometimes there are little editorial notes that say things like, you know, guys, just bear with us. We, we promise there will be a murder. Just keep, <laughs> keep reading and you're waiting for the murder. Um, but what's spectacular is that you really get involved with the lives of the characters and you kind of don't yeah. care if the murder ever comes because you just... You're enjoying what you're reading and it must be very easy to read you know and and because we're used to whatsapp messages and facebook messages so it's almost like um almost more accessible for the younger generation even for us to like it is yeah i mean i, th I think it's a fantastic idea and um, it's very, very novel yeah. uh, i've not seen anything done like this before you know and as i say 300 no, pages i read it in one day because it's just it's, it's very, very easy to, to get through. It's just an, an, an endless conversation, you know? Yeah, yeah. It does. Um, it's very original. The closest thing I can think of is the Cell novel, which is quite big in East Asia. So basically, um, it's basically a similar concept. Novels through the format of text messages, or I'm not sure if they use WhatsApp messages, but that, that basically you're reading it from the phone, a new novel, and you just like a work in progress. You just like Dickensian, like the new Dickens, like yeah. writing the after every day but sending it to your phone and so but i like this format even better i like it okay. cool i know something else yeah and so the, the the main chap is a guy called um lomax and he's been off doing a secondment so he's basically been off on holidays in, in sicily wor working um but actually he's just kind of mm. having having a nice time really and then he has to come back to the office and kind of get back to reality. And his boss, Julian, yeah. doesn't like him. And, you know, he gives him a bad performance review, even though he did a good job in Sicily. And kind of says, you do a good oh. job, but you're cynical and you're not a company man. You know, you make jokes yeah. about me. So give you a bad review and you don't get your bonus this year. And you, you think, well, this guy Julian's a bit of an ass. But then he's got a lot of stuff himself. He's trying to manage a team um, that doesn't have enough staff. You know, the bosses aren't giving him resources. He's in, hmm. he's struggling with coming out as being gay to his dad. He's got a, a partner who's just an alcoholic and doesn't contribute anything to the, you know, to the rent or anything like that. So, and is actually quite abusive to him. So you, you, oh, you, you actually think initially you think this guy's the bad guy. And then you realize, no, he's not. He's just a, a complicated character, you know? And, and even the main guy, Lomax, isn't that great you know he he is very cynical and he is you know not a yes man which is a trait that i like but he struggles <laughs> with some kind of loneliness himself he's not very personable he's immediately kind of not nice to the new girl who starts and, and this kind of stuff you know he's a bit of an anti-hero in some ways and doesn't really care about anyone but he's obsessed with this girl he met in sicily who's this super bohemian girl but she's also really, really a just very horrible, unpleasant person. And she's sometimes abusive to him as well, just mean and, and you know, um, going around with other guys and calling him a loser and all this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. And just ignoring him for, for you know, periods of time. Uh, and there's one nice character who's Wen Lee, this new girl who starts. Um, and she starts in the office. And she initially doesn't like Lomax, but she gets to know him and, and gets to like him eventually and, and actually falls in love with him. And this is this is early, uh, early page kind okay. of stuff, you know, okay. but she she's a very, very nice um, character, you know, and I, I really, really enjoy um, what she what she brings because she's supportive. She does get into a relationship that, you know, with someone who cheats on her, but she's really good with with um Lomax and I think that they have a good a good relationship together so oh, hold on a second now PJ oh. I think we might be getting a, a call here oh, Lord. 
Who's that? Hello, you're through to Books Boys. You got both Dean and PJ on the line. Who's calling? Hello, it's Tom McCauley here. Ah, uh, Tom! Wow, what a what a coincidence. We were we were just chatting <laughs> about uh, countdown to a killing. There, we have an endless Another series of these coincidence. coincidences every every month. You know, crazy. <laughs> exactly on the right time. Exactly the right time. That's every amazing. time. Yeah. Impressive. Authors must all be telepathic. I don't know. I don't know how they do it. It's special connection. Yeah, special book like instinct. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. No, no problem. Is it very pleased to join you and. Uh, you know, I'd heard um, um, some complimentary things you said about the novel, so it was a great chance to, to, to talk to you guys about it. So thanks very much for having me. That's right. I also submitted a little review. I, I read this in the day, like I was just telling BJ there, genuinely. The, the way that it yeah. flows with the snippets of WhatsApps and emails just made it such that I couldn't put it down. It was just an endless conversation that I thought, well, I want to find out what, you know, who says what next. And, and I couldn't. And you're building up to the murder, of course, as well. So you keep thinking, okay, we've got to keep going, keep going, you know. <laughs> Uh, yes, I think it's uh, guys great to hear that. I think that the um the the sort of the thrust towards the crime it does keep one um on one's toes, although of course it's a bit tongue in cheek and uh, you know on, on one level is a sort of not a pastiche of the crime fiction, but sort of is is, is taking that slightly lightheartedly while exploring mm -hmm. perhaps deeper issues. Yeah, okay. there are. I was saying there as well. There's some issues with. So I was talking about the characters before you rang in, and of course. Would it be safe to say that, apart from maybe Wen Lee, who I think is a lovely person, Lomax and Julian, they have really good qualities and also some some bad qualities. And I think that it's just a lot of characters struggling with, essentially, with aspects of normal life. And some of them have, you know, maybe some loneliness issues and relationship issues and, and just trying to fight their way through existence almost. Yes, I think that's <clears throat> exactly right, because people were saying... You know, some reviews are saying, oh, it's a cast of eccentric characters. And I said, well, actually, it is and it isn't. It is. But actually, if you that's because we are privy to their private messages and emails. And if you got an average bunch of people from the street or work, you know, they're probably no more eccentric than the average person. And, yeah, you know, and I think that the binding, the thing that does bind them all is is, that, is indeed the loneliness. And they're all kind of hiding that in different ways. And, and it's interesting to say that about when, because many people have said she's, you know, clearly got oodles of, of, of you know kindness etc although i i always thought that you know perhaps she was a little bit needy as well sometimes and i think lomax does that in an oh, area so yeah. she's yeah but you're absolutely right about the other characters and um i i, I felt that uh, you know the structure of the novel really goes to show the different sides because you're you're presented you know for example julian as the sort of horrible boss with a mean name for him the you know the rat witch and then rat witch this, little do you know that he's in the same room emailing his abusive partner and you know is in this horrible toxic relationship so yeah but but it's good that you you know it's interesting that you picked up on that loneliness thing because I think that does pervade all the characters lives actually yeah and you're, you're perfectly <laughs> right about Julian initially you don't like him until you find out a bit more about him and you realize you know oh he's actually a very sympathetic character you know yeah Absolutely. He's um, he, some people have actually said to me that they're actually he's the favorite character because, wow. uh, mm. yeah, because the, the sort of I think anybody who's I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm not a boss, but I think anyone who's been a boss must feel frustrated that, um, mm. you know, you've got these two people when and Lomax were sort of demon, demonizing him in some way. Mm. And yet they're actually not the ones doing much work. They've got limited responsibilities and he's the one trying to keep the ship afloat and and is you know it is having just as tough a time if not far tougher than than them so so yeah yeah it apparently came across quite sympathetically yeah. uh, my favorite character is Wen's mum even though we don't really see her she doesn't do a lot <laughs> in the novel but it's just when you see the the little text and Wen's like no he doesn't want to read my poems from when I was a kid you know he can't yeah. read Chinese you know it's like no stick to the recipe why have you made something different mom yeah. please I, I love it <laughs> <laughs> Very it's, good. It's nice to say that because I think that um, people were saying it was interesting that the, the correspondence is one sided from all the characters. But actually, I, I think that, well, obviously, that's very deliberate, sort of conscious literary device. But also, I think it does allow you to get your own impression of the characters who you never yeah. actually hear from directly, um, whether that be the abusive Toby, um, you know, Julian's partner, or, 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 or Wen's mum. You can just see running around 
uh, and stressing her out sort of thing. Um, I hope it brings them to that. And Katie, you know, Katie, sort yeah. of stuck in the law firm all night, it, just listening to, reading these endless emails from her sort of slightly lonely friend. I couldn't figure out the dynamic there. So PJ, there's this this friend, Katie, that Lomax has. Mm-hmm. He emails her every week, uh, so, well, in theory, okay. once a week, but sometimes more, sort of regular mm-hmm. updates about his life. And then eventually she accidentally kind of, you know, forwards on a reply where she kind of isn't too kind to him and they, they fall out for a while. But it's oh, just exactly. his loneliness again coming out. He wants someone to talk to and to give little updates to, you know? Yeah, um, I just loved how Lomax oh. is... Um, Lomax's kind of view of the world is is sort of wonderfully diverse from the reality you know so he's he's sitting there in this small flat with a leaky roof and he's writing these slightly grandiose emails to this to this friend of his who's clearly far more successful than him and yeah. <laughs> you know, got, got a lot more going on in her life and um but he he's he's really getting into his emails and sort of and I, I, th- I thought that was important that because not many people or not, you know, it's a certain type of person who writes those type of long emails. So I think it needed to be a wannabe writer um, who was, you know, lost in his own dream of doing something special. Um, and she just puts up with it. I think she, you know, she kind of puts up with this. And as yeah. you say, she then finally cracks one night and says to her husband, God, I've had this, you know, this crap through from Lomax again. But unfortunately, she sends it to Lomax, which is quite painful to her. Uh, to, to read. <laughs> But you mentioned a key detail there, and um, so this might interest you, PJ, is that uh, Lomax is a writer like yourself um, and okay. like Tom. So he initially, now, he initially he wants to write a kind of sequel to Agatha Christie's, and, and then there were none called, and, and earlier there were 10, kind of a backwards uh, version, <laughs> which which he realizes, you know, after some time is not going to work. <laughs> so he... <laughs> yeah, and then he gets into this. I think he, he writes it, and then... Um... The reviewer says to him, "Oh, that's really, really funny," and and he's devastated because it wasn't meant to be funny. Oh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he then um, he then realizes that his his latest mad then idea is to actually I'll make it really, really funny and I'll make it as bad as it could be. So it's a sort of pastiche uh, of a yeah. of a of a. So yeah, it's just he's he's constantly on the lookout for for brilliant literary ideas and not really able to execute them very well. Yeah, he yeah. seems to get progress eventually. Like he's in touch with an old yes. uh, college professor or whatever who helped him with literature and she gives him some tips. Um, she's not always yeah. necessarily there for him when he needs her, but... No, <laughs> no. And I thought there's that sort of thing that I deliberately tried to subtly bring in. Like maybe he's driving this poor lady mad as well, you know, mm. but he keeps he keeps right. referring to it as Professor Nithicott because he's proud that he's got this backer. But actually... Maybe she sometimes she doesn't really reply for for quite a while. So. Yeah, <laughs> but I like his view of the world, and I was sad when Julian said, you know, you did all right at, at your job, but you know, you're cynical and you make jokes and you're not a company yes man. And I thought, good, you know, promote this yeah, man. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it does exactly. sound like a very realistic book, to be honest. I mean, you know, people writing WhatsApp messages, sometimes people writing loquacious emails and not getting answered. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and I, think, I think it's to do with self-esteem as well. And, you know, it's that classic, he hasn't got any self-esteem in his job. Um, where he gains his self-esteem from is his, um, is his big dream that, you know, that one day he'll be out of here and, yeah. uh, and, and doing his thing. And I think many people can relate to that who do, who do oh, any totally, job. Totally. It makes me think there are probably many uh, novels in private WhatsApp conversations because those are very long messages. Put them all together, edit it a bit. And you might have some very interesting insights into their lives, maybe even truer, truer literature than what they might try to write artificially, feel like. Yeah, yeah that's why I chose this medium, actually, because I, I was like, you know, it seems to be a really, well, one, it's kind of a very recent development, isn't it, for like humans generally, yeah. that we're putting down in messages stuff that wasn't really made for written yeah. correspondence, yeah. you know, like, so in the old days, mm-hmm. if you said, oh, Tom's in a real idiot, you would know that you were just saying that to let off steam and you didn't mean to state on the record. But then if I read you your WhatsApp about me saying that, that would be very hurtful. And if you think about it, we're therefore all capable of having hurt virtually everyone close yeah. to us one time or another through a WhatsApp. And, and I thought that was quite, I've always thought that was quite a scary development. And maybe future generations will think, what were we doing 
put, you know, committing all this to sort of the written permanent word when actually we didn't mean yeah, yeah. most of it. You know? yeah. I mean, we, we produce uh, more written material yeah. than any civilization in history. It's insane. The amount of just data, ninety yeah. percent of which is is you know mundane. <laughs> mundane and just our thoughts but yeah, at the time and not our yeah. real opinion and you know there's a sort of mm. doomsday scenario that someone leaks all what's up to everyone or something and then everyone falls out with everyone they've ever known you know <laughs> it also makes for both i feel like it can make both for a raw story and yet also cruder maybe as well like crude and raw so it's like a mixture of, of it could be it could be a deeper real uh, literature it could be a really superficial li literature and it feels like you're playing yeah. around with both of them Yes, yeah. so because Lomax is this creative person, he writes these long, you know, yeah. wannabe beautiful descriptions yeah. of everything he's doing and then meandering. And then you've got the British Chinese girl who's much more to the point with short and sharp WhatsApps, which sort of break up the rhythm somewhat, you know. So. Yes, she's very yeah. much just here's what's happening. And she's a sympathetic character, you know, even before what happens with her parents, she's sympathetic, just, you know, she's taking on the new job she's got some kind of her, her own kind of mental health issues and things like that she does have the loneliness she's she's willing to date a guy that cheated on her just because i think she doesn't want to be lonely and, and lomax yeah. doesn't seem to want her and and, mm -hmm. and it's sad at times you know yeah i think i think i'm, I'm glad you, you you picked that up because there is a sort of element of the, not really darkness but sadness pervading some of these characters and uh, yeah. i think that the um the when and lomax thing is is exactly that that he's got these, these self-esteem issues and doesn't really think that it would ever be a go with her because she's such an all-round you know fascinating person and yeah instead he's going after this really mm. sort of odd character in in another country and, you've, uh, you've, you've took me where i wanted i'm gonna ask you a question about her in a second <laughs> yeah well um and, and then no i was just gonna say and then when is clearly um also got self-esteem issues and um and is lonely and is going out with this you know we all know the type, don't we? Some sort of young city guy who thinks he's top dog and actually isn't very nice and she could do a lot better than him. Yeah. So tell us about the the, the girlfriend in, in Sicily, you know, because a very interesting character and maybe the only character that I don't like, you know. Yeah. I don't, she doesn't do anything mm. that makes me like her the way maybe Julian does. The more you see about mm. him, you think, oh, he's not a bad guy, really. She's just kind of not, she's mean. She's mean. <laughs> she, she's mean and uh, it's, a, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because the obvious point about her is you don't get to hear her voice back. Yeah. And that was sort of deliberate. And in the postscript to the novel without giving anything away, there's a sort of slightly jarring uh, bit about, you know, it is noted that um, Aurora made a serious allegation about Lomax. And and that's what I wanted to do throughout, just put this slight, I don't think there is any doubt because of the third party experiences of what happened there, but maybe there's this doubt that maybe it wasn't actually as straightforward as everything mm. you've just read. And maybe Lomax was a bit, you know, was not um, not a dark mm. character, but may maybe, may maybe not. And I think, yeah, I think the interesting thing about her was that I thought it was important because there's a lot of positive female characters in the novel um, and and I thought there's nothing wrong with sort of having a balance there mm. and having a, a sort of the type, you know, a female, not stereotypical female either, but a female type who perhaps isn't great. Because I, I think that it is important to show the full round and you don't want to have this situation where, you know, when's clearly the nicest character, Katie's the most solid and successful, all the men are damaged. And I thought it was um, balancing to have the type of female character that um, that, you know, is probably not as that common but, but but you know clearly does exist and 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 hopefully manage to delicately towards the end you know give the impression that actually it's not just that she's a she's unpleasant but she may have you know real issues herself um, yeah. and and yeah so but i just thought it fitted well with um with lomax because you know he he needed to be sort of in love with someone who was so obviously on paper not a great person mm -hmm. but he was constantly in his quest to sort of have this happy ending to his life um even know, when he has a better option romantic. presenting itself to him he sticks with yeah. like no i have to go back to this toxic <laughs> girl you know well, he's a, he, as many artists are he's a romantic right in the sense of exactly. he's romanticizing someone who is not really what he ex he, he expects mm -hmm. no and, and it's distance and it's you know it's based on a short passionate uh, experience abroad and that sort mm. of thing is so different from the sort of humans that we we know yeah. on the basis of regular day-to-day -day correspondence so you're right he's um 
he's that's exactly the word he's he's deeply romanticized her and it's sort of comical and slightly painful when he sort of gives the objective story of what happened that day and the reader yeah. can clearly see oh god man she you know get, get away but he's sort of explaining <laughs> that it was actually romantic or something you know it's, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and lastly we should we should mention um fifi um pj yes. fifi's this italian um well he's he's a he's a dwarf and he we also see a lot of problems with his family because he, his family have fallen out with him you know they don't get on with him really it seems that his height is, is one of the driving forces there but he's just a lovely lovely person and he's very fiercely defending Lomax, his new friend and he attaches himself like super kind of i want to hang out all the time and i'm here to defend you and all this kind of stuff you know let me adam kind of scrappy do style almost like you know I'm, I'm 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 sticking up for you but he's a lovely lovely guy and you feel really bad for him when he reaches out to his family and they're just not interested you know yeah so, i think that was um because obviously um you know it, with the with the with the drive that I fully support you know about sort of inclusive writing and I do think that people with restricted growth probably is a real area which hasn't been explored and it's so easy to write about them and sort of be you know to, to read about them and sort of it could have been comical or mean or something you know and mm -hmm. and, I, and I thought what about you know inverting that and really giving him humanity and and the sadness and and, and respect and actually in yeah. some art, in some ways he's the hero of the of the novel and um you know, and and so yeah, it was quite interesting um, reading about that, and and it's this sort of classic thing, isn't it, where <clears throat> it could be comical from Lomax's perspective in some ways mm -hmm. on a superficial level, but if you think about it, you're like, but that's just as mean as yeah, that's just as mean as any of the other stereotypes that we're addressing in the book, such as you know, ethnicity or sexuality or whatever. So it's it deserves you know equal equal delicacy. And Lomax isn't necessarily such a good friend back. He's not, you know, he's not, he's not a terrible friend, but he's not, mm. you know, he's, he doesn't really care, yes. you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing about Lomax. He's clearly good hearted and is, is, you know, prepared to defend him, but equally is so wrapped up in himself that, um, and as you say, that's the, when people say, oh, Lomax is just this lovely character or lovable, it's like, well, he's very human. Like he's not perfect mm. actually. And, uh, and does tend to see everything from his own, dramatic you know overly dramatic view of what is a rather <laughs> unremarkable life um, yeah but yeah i have one question for you because you know you're so you're a solicitor and you wanted yeah. to write a crime novel was there any what what prevented you and thank goodness it you know it it did because this novel's amazing but was there any desire to be like right i'm gonna do like a john grisham style just intricate legal thriller or or did you immediately say no like that's not what i want to do yeah yeah no it was it was funny it wasn't it was it was actually originally i was thinking more of um it, it sort of the crime came about um sort of later in the thought process actually so it, it was more that um I really wanted to write about these different characters and 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 use the the, the you know use the form um, and, and particularly the the idea of multiple stories playing out and crime the crime sort of genre just appealed because with something like that you really do need an impetus and a structure otherwise you're going to get lost in all these people's stories without any narrative mm. thrust so I just find that the crime genre is great for for giving impetus to the story and as I say it's tongue-in-cheek but at the same time you are driven on to find out well what what does actually happen here yeah. but no I've never um so far written um a, a thriller like that actually um um but but yeah hopefully it still gives a bit of you know page tech focus um it does and so this has only just come out so do you want to tell us like is there have you already got ideas for what's next or take a break yeah it, it took no well actually it took um I, I, writing the novel didn't take as long as my first one so it was kind of like one or one or two years on and off um and then it just took a while to get it published so, you know it's um it's as we probably all know the the uh you know the publishing world and agency world is is quite slow to say the yeah. least and um so that did take a while of uh, false starts and or, or rather me me focusing too much on a particular publisher and then you know revising it and so in the meantime, was writing a third one, which is which is different, very different from this. Um, so actually, you know, that's a really nice thing about having a novel published because you've got, um, you think that's just off my plate now. You know, people can say what they want, but there's, I, I'm not touching that again. And um, it's really nice to just revisit these drafts and, and, you know, it's almost like a blank page again, or even though it's quite developed. So yeah, this the third one will be will be very different. 
Nice. Do you want to tell us real quick where we can go to get this one then? Do you want to give us a plug? The, 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 yeah, the tell, tell us where to get the book. Oh, yeah. So it's in, um, it's in Waterstones. It's obviously Amazon's very easy to get. It's mm -hmm. um, WH Smith seemed to be um, um, stocking it as well. And I think lots Good. of independent bookshops, I've been told, have got it. So, but Waterstone certainly would be the obvious one on the high street. Cool. I'll put a link in the show notes anyway, just to your site and things like that, so people can check it out. Well, PJ, do you have any any other questions before I ask the uh, the usual final question? Well, I do want to know. Uh, can you can you tell us briefly what inspired you to write the novel? Ultimately, was it was it looking at what's up culture, or was there a specific incident maybe that? kind of triggered one point of the story yeah it was it was the the first one of those actually so it it really was kind of if I'm going to write the second novel how are we going to make it relevant it was it was during the period where you know Netflix had really kicked off and it was like is the novel you know which is still the discussion now is how relevant is the novel and and then I thought well you know how do you how do you write something which doesn't become, you don't want this, it's either a novel or it's this kind of very comic book type, you know, colorful yeah. what's up, which would yeah. bore everyone. And it's like, how can you turn that into a, you know, realistic, but into a proper novel telling? And I used to enjoy epistry novels as well, like the old fashioned ones. And yeah. so I thought, give it a go. And I thought, but it does have to have a character who likes to write, otherwise mm -hmm. it would be very tedious to read. And the WhatsApps are, you know, a very small percentage okay. of, the, of the text. Cool. Yeah. Very good. Well, our last question I asked everyone, um, and I never let anyone prep for it, so I'm going to spring this one on you, but if there's any book that exists, essentially it's what's your favourite book, but not quite. If there's any book that exists that you wish you'd been the author of, what would it be? Wow, okay. Um, so... A hundred years of solitude is obviously. Oh, yeah. There you go, PJ. You love that one. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I put should... you after by Derek Garcia Marcus for the listeners. Right. <laughs> it's just I just find that novel. I read it at university, I had to, and it's the only novel. It sounds really weird what I'm about to say, but I was going off to the exam and I read the end again just before the exam. And mm. there's a line when it says, and then the wind began. And I actually felt yeah. some wind. And I was like, Jesus, I mean, this the way this guy writes. And wow. again, it was, you know, very intertextual. I would, you know, unless in case people haven't heard of it, I won't give it away. But the, the idea that you're you're reading a book that may be a book that someone else is writing within the novel and that it's self-referential and all that. I just I love mm. all that. Brilliant. Well, I I actually do mention it in almost every episode. He it mentions is, it a lot, and I've not read it yet. <laughs> one of my desert island books, and the same with you. When I read that ending, I was at a stormy beach, and right. yeah, I, I was out spoiling anything. But uh, obviously, it was a perfect place to read such an ending. And I felt many yeah. times throughout the books these different emotions and feelings, and I laughed out loud. And it was it's also a comic and tragic. It's beautiful. Yes. Yes. Great well. choice. There we are then. Tom, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for calling in. And I absolutely love the book. So whenever I, I hear tell that the next one's out, I'll be sure to pick it up. Oh, well, thanks very much, guys. Really enjoyed that chat. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Really Take care. It. Take it easy. Bye. 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 See you. Well, well, there we go. Uh, series wow. of endless coincidences, but brilliant, brilliant book. Count down to and a and I am delighted that he chose 100 Years of Solitude. So there you go, Dean. You <laughs> I know, yeah, you love it. I know, I know you're skeptical about your Latin American literature, but it is a quintessential novel, as I always say. All right, say. all right. Well, I'll take two minutes here before we move on, just to mention to everyone. So booksboys.com is our website. You can find links to their various things on there, uh, including our Patreon. And you can just go directly to patreon.com slash booksboys as well, and you can get the extra shows that we do. So... This month, what's just come out, the last, you're probably thinking these have been going on forever, but the final episode of Interviews from the Vault, episode 15, where <laughs> I interviewed Danny Seraphine, the original drummer from the hit band Chicago. If you leave me now, you take away oh. the biggest part of me. So I interviewed him for his yeah. solo album um, nine years ago, and you can, you can catch that on the last Interviews from the Vault. We also released this month some Playboys Extra, Luthe de Bohemia, with Mireya, we talked about the, the Valle, uh, Del Valle Inclan play, a uh, Galician author. And it's a great play. Yeah. Play. And we also did the Lorca play, The House of Bernarda Alba. So there's been a couple of episodes out um, this month. So basically what you can get on our Patreon is Playboys, where we review plays. A lot of Shakespeare's on there. I think 14 or 15 Shakespeare's, a couple of other things. 
Plus, you got Film Fellows, Dark Place Dreamers, Caper Captains, and, and a whole mishmash of crazy things. So, we've got two random Norwegian plays just for fun, just for the yeah, Norsk okay. fan. We do. We got we got a lot of stuff on there. We got some poetry pals, music men, games guys. You know, so check it check it out, guys, on the Patreon, and you can get yourself a Books Boys T shirt, and you can recommend books for us to to read and all that kind of stuff. And and then that, that helps us, and that means I can afford another trip to Spain. So you know, it's it's the do thing. that, yeah. and, <laughs> which would lead to further Instagram photos of the imposing yeah. with with books, and we all need that. The world needs that just as That's much as piece, right? Yeah, it's it's very very important on the top. The UN meetings, they're saying we need more book photos from, <laughs> from uh, the books boys, you know, so it's on there. Well, guys, I think 